Hello, everyone. Welcome to this wonderful panel. Can you hold me, hear me okay? Yep. Now, first thing, I just want to apologize. I've got a very strong accent. I'm from the eastern part of Canada. So just if you have any questions or you can't hear me properly, just let me know straight away. Okay, I won't be offended or anything. So this is a panel uh, with the First Nation elders that we have here. We have a wonderful panel of elders from across the globe uh, and really amazing people to uh, show the insight about lots of beautiful things that we're going to talk about today. And we're going to be talking about uh, three main questions, which will be spiritu spiritual unity, collective consciousness, and sustainable future. But before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodian of this land on which we stand today, the Jajarong people and the Wadarong people of the Kulin Nation. And I'll pay my respect to the elders, past and present and emerging. And I would like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as the first people of what we now call Australia, and the Aboriginal sovereignty has never been ceded. And this is really important to actually say that for myself today and probably for a lot of people. As we know, this is an important day for pretty much all of Australia. Some people will call this Australia Day. Some people will call today uh, Survival Day or Massacre Day. So um, there's a lot of you know, deep understanding and deep thinking that we need to think about what this means for different people in this country today. Okay, and I would so also like to recognize that First Nation people have strong and continuing connection to land, water, and culture. So welcome again. So I will uh, slowly introduce um, <coughs> the panel of the amazing elders that we have here today. So we have people from Canada, from the United States, um, from Norway, and from different, also a lot of indigenous people from Australia as well. So, <coughs> you all good? Not getting too hot? No, it's going to get hotter. <laughs> you better be ready. Okay, so here we have Grandmother Malihakwa. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, Grandmother Malihakwa is from British Columbia in Canada. And so she's a warrior woman and elder mother who lineage is from Samakwam on the mother's side and Shukwakwamok. Shukwamok. I've tried my best to do the proper pronunciation. Good. I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, <coughs> on her mother's side, on the father's side. So she has been involved with issues arising from injustice faced by Aboriginal women for many decades, and she's also a traditional healer, sacred pipe carrier, and is a treasured ceremonial advisor of the International Sundance Elders Council. Okay, thank you very much for being here today. Okay, and uh, here we also have Ben Rod, who's an uh, important person from the Lakota tribe in South Dakota. Uh, he's a well, uh, ben Rod is a well-respected elder of the Lakota tribes, and he has been involved with the gathering of eagles in South Dakota for 31 years. He has been an inspiring force in the fight against the DALP pipeline in South Dakota, as probably so many of you have heard. There's been a lot of big fight happening in Dakota to stop the uh, tar sand pipeline going through. And it has inspired many other people from different ways of life to stand strong against the destructive forces that threaten sacred sites and the land. He also has been addressing human rights issues since the 1984 in the geopolitical arena as an advocate for indigenous sovereignty. So thank you, Ben, for being here today. Thank you very much. Okay, and we also have a wonderful lady from the Sami tribe from Norway, Finland, and Sweden that now lives in South America, um, in South, I can't talk, in America. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making things up here. Her name is Juanita Rod, and she's been involved with the Gathering of Eagles with her husband, Ben, for over 31 years. She's number one as a mother and now grandmother of 13 grandchildren, all coming from being an only child, so that's pretty good. <laughs> really amazing. <laughs> Her education is as a counsellor and special education teacher on the reservation in South Dakota since 1983-94 of the school year. At 70 years of, uh, of age, she continues to serve children at the Little Wound School on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, and she's living with her husband, Ben, in the Black Hills of South Dakota. 
And today she's gonna, we're going to be very lucky today because she's going to talk to us about uh, Sumi uh, heritage. So it's something that probably not many people have heard before, but it's amazing um, indigenous people from Norway and Sweden in those areas. So we're going to be hearing a little bit more about her history. So that'd be pretty amazing to hear that. Okay. Now, next person that we have on the board here. Sorry, I've got to turn my pages here. Got too many pages. Okay, it's Phil. It's Phil Blythe. So Phil is born, was born in Bork in New South Wales. His father was Kalili Waka Waka, man from the southwest Queensland. His mother is a Kalkadoon woman from Queensland, and both parents were taken from their homelands as children and sent to Palm Island Mission in Shelbourne. So Phil has been involved in the community in community development and devote much of his time to reconciliation. He's a foundation member of the Five Land Walk, which strives to create a more harmonious and inclusive society. So thank you very much, Phil, for being on the board today. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, now we come to Auntie Marilyn. Marilyn is from the Jajarong uh, people. And she's a master weaver and a claim artist. Marilyn, Auntie Marilyn has lived most of her life around the Murray, called the Millow, and around its waterways. She was encouraged to learn how to weave by her mother and taught where to found and how to harvest the native grasses that she used for weaving. She's been part of the Center for Culture based in Bendigo region and has been running basket weaving workshops to local communities and internationally. Her ancestral lineage is from multi clan with connections to Jajarong, Barapa Barapa, Yoda Yoda, Wati Wati, Laji Laj, Yopag Gulp, and Gnagdonjiri tribes. So thank you very much, Auntie Marilyn. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, now our last person on the board here, and not the least, I would say, uh, is Maji. From so Maji is. Maji, I can am I saying it properly? Probably not. Mujai. Am I? Mujai. Okay, I'll try. It's my bad French Canadian accent, I told you. I'm so sorry about that. So yeah, Mujai. Okay, so Mujai was born in Amidale in the northern tablelands of New South Wales in 1974. He's a descendant of the Gnak Wana Wana sorry for saying bad badly there. Uh, Genguti and Gombenja Nation and has also English, Irish and Scottish heritage. So Jeremy's uh, career started pretty early, and I think he's going to tell us a little story later on about that. But um, he started pa painting many artistic, his artistic career in 97 when he traveled to Darwin, when he met Peter Manaburu, a traditional man for the Baranga community of Arnhem Land, who allowed David to paint with him. In 1999, he was then uh, working as an artist with the elder Joseph Beard Wallace at Remagini, and together they painted for several years in a style that they call together Spirit Way. And I think later on, uh, Mujai is going to talk a little bit more about what he's been doing with his painting. And he's got some pretty incredible stories to tell us about that. And he has been uh, doing an ex exhibit extensively nationally and internationally, including Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Holland and Ibiza. And pretty much all around Australia as well. So thank you very much for all of you for being here today. So can we give an applause to all of our beautiful members of the board? Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to take a seat just to make myself a bit more comfortable. Okay, so we're going to talk about some pretty amazing, beautiful uh, subjects today. Um, can you hold me, hear me all right? Because I don't seem to be hearing me pretty, pretty well. Is it all good? It sounds good? Okay. So... <coughs> So today, we pretty much, uh, as we all know, we are pretty much facing a big critical crisis with our planet Earth. And, um, you know, it's a very critical time for many of us. And, um, you know, it feels like it's pretty overwhelming. You know, we've got climate change knocking on our door. And we've also a lot of got issues in Australia with drought and different things. So we're going to be talking today about um, things that's going to be relevant to that, pe giving people hope. So we're going to be talking firstly about spiritual unity. So like I was saying, more than ever, we, we need to stand strong today with each other. We're all living things to face the challenges that we are now facing. This brings me to talk about spiritual unity. So I'll be asking the board and the members here if maybe they can talk to us a little bit about what that means for them. 
So what spiritual unity might mean for you in this critical time that we face today? So anybody welcome to answer the questions when, when you are ready. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Um, 31 years ago, we began to, uh, from a vision from a grandmother in Canada, begin to promote the spiritual unity of the tribes. And that has grown to be in many lands and continents, and including here. And a spiritual unity, what does it mean? Um, we looked at what has happened from the, not just from the vision of our grandmother from Canada, but looking at what has happened in Western medicine. In Western medicine, you deal with the mind, you deal with the body, you deal with what is wrong. But there's one aspect that the medical profession does not address, and that is the spirit. They refuse to. They say that is the purview of the church, that is the purview of some theology that takes us from understanding ourselves fully as a human being. And the unity that we should have within each one of us is that heart, that mind, that body, and that spirit. So if you have a, a spiritual element of some nature, and you can place that into your emotional condition or your psychological, etc. That one most essential part of your being is being denied healing. So how can you heal the rest of you without that unity of spirit with your own individual self, but also with those who are your relatives? In our way, from the Lakota, we have a word, mitakuye oyasin. What that means is all my relations. And it, and of itself, is a prayer. So every day, and just a little while ago, I was sitting in camp, made a prayer. Mitakuye oyasin. Simple because I recognize my relations, and that's each one of you, because you are two-legged, as am I, but also everything that moves in creation is part of me, and I am responsible for it because I have the power of reason. So I don't want to talk too long about that, but just simply as a perhaps a, uh, an understanding for you to take into your life and understand that healing for all of us individually, community-wise, family, must begin within ourselves and transition into a sustainable future. And I know that's another topic, but just simply to say it to that extent. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for this beautiful insight. Does anybody else would like to talk about what this means for them? Yeah, I, I would. Um, look, I'd, I'd like to thank everybody for, for their presence here today. It truly is a gift to us. And I really mean that it, a gift in the sense that uh, a gift is something that has no conditions. It's freely given, and it must be received in the same spirit. It must be freely see received as well, and it's something that goes around and grows. Once you attach a condition to it, it stops becoming a gift. This land is a gift to us, and it's freely given lots of stuff to us, and we must receive that in the same way. About 231 years ago, what, what happened? I think it's today, <laughs> coincidentally. Some people came into this land wrong way. 
And in that 231 years, uh, we haven't really been able to come to terms with that imposition. They brought with them a new law, a new uh, health system, a new education system, a new religion. Christianity, now I've got no... Uh, I'm not criticising Christianity. Christianity is a really good way to explore your spirituality if you're wanting to explore your spirituality. So there are a number of other ways you can explore your spirituality as well, with Buddhism, um, the Islamic religions. I mean, all these religions are tried and tested. They're proven. And you can the good ways to explore your spirituality. And Christianity is a good way of exploring your spirituality as well. But I think you must take it on warts and all. And, and it's the same with our Aboriginal religions as well. And I think what actually happened in this land here is that 231 years ago when the British came and uh, started their process of co colonisation, and let's not be shy about this, it was a deliberate attempt of genocide. But I'm pleased to say that things have evolved since then. Uh, we live in a fairly, fairly good society and we're all beneficiaries of that society as well and I'm, I'm a beneficiary of that as, and, and I have opportunities certainly that my parents didn't have some years ago when they were taken away as children. So I'm really grateful for that and I think we all should be grateful for that as well. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that there was an imposition of another law and another religion, another spirituality on this country and it ignored the spirituality of this country. Our spirit runs deep into this ground. I've heard people like Pauline Hanson say, uh, who's a politician, uh, say that she's indigenous to this land because she's been here for some five generations or more. Well, fair enough. She was born here and, and uh, that, that's fair enough, I would say. But her spirituality is only very shallow. Ours is very deep. So what? So how how do we come to terms with that? Because there's a tension there, and those tensions are manifested themselves in lots of different ways in our lives. We see it on a daily basis with the incarceration, the high incarceration of Aboriginal people in Australia, particularly Aboriginal young men. It's seen on other levels as well in education and in health. But so. One of the things I really think is that um, the, the British came here by the, the spirit of the ocean, the wind of the ocean, the windy spirit. And we came here uh, in our mythology by the spirit of the cosmos. And uh, so we've been here for a really long time. And so I think the question is then, how, how do those two um, exist? and talk to each other when they come together. When we consider that Bruce Pascoe is talking here this afternoon, and come and see him as well, because he said something the other day uh, when I was watching him on TV. He said, our Aboriginal law is the most environmentally intelligent law in the planet. And I thought that was just a wonderful way of putting it. Because our law, our power, comes from within the environment and the colonizers their law their power comes from legislation from acts of parliament so they are operating from a position where they're creating this illusion that they they have power over the environment our power is in the environment it's two different ways of thinking and we need to look at how we can reconcile those two different ways of thinking to start with and then the other thing is we really need to you know, find a way for Christianity because the, the Western culture is predicated on Christianity. The common law is predicated on the Ten Commandments. And uh, so we need to, f in instead of imposing it on this country, I think we need to find a way to graft their spirituality onto the spirit of this place. Now, that's a journey and a half, I can tell you. When we're doing that, 
um, in a very practical way. Uh, we mentioned when in the introduction here that I'm a foundation member of Five Lands Walk, which is an event up on the central coast in New South Wales, and we as a community are, are exploring that in a very, very practical way. Uh, we have lots of people coming together, really good people, and we're, f we're, we're sort of journeying together and trying to find a way in which we can uh, graft their spirituality onto the spirit of this land. And, and we're in the process finding out ways that we can talk in a mature and sensible way. And, you know, talk and, and, and uh, you know, maybe then we can start to uh, have decent conversations about how to resolve environmental issues and other issues that impact on us. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for that. Yeah, we're very lucky in Australia because, you know, we've got such an opportunity to learn from Indigenous cultures, the most ancient living culture on Earth, and here we are, you know, hearing from the stories and the, the wisdom of the people here. So we're very, very privileged. Okay. Um, anybody else? Would you like to have a talk about um, unity? Thank you so very much for um, sharing your wisdom here. The knowledge keepers of this land, it's an honor to be among you. And my, uh, what I understand from the subject on this panel is one of the things that I've believed in since I can remember is unity through diversity. The very first thing that I ever took on after about five years of, of uh, being in the field and having a look around what was happening to our people, we were only gathering at sad occasions, and that's our terminology for saying funerals. And I had an aunt and uncle who drowned, and they had to be autopsied, so it took a week to get that done. And in that week, we were all together in our community hall. We were sharing food, we were sharing comfort, we were sharing everything that we had in a communal way, such as we had lived before which is our natural way of living. So after a week of listening to my elders crying the same tears from within, their heart was so sore, I went away with a prayer that let us find a way to gather together where there are no drugs and alcohol and that children and people can have um, safety so then we, we worked on it for, for, for a few years to gather this. We did barbecues and fundraise. Uh, we brought the community together in many ways in our cultural dance and, and, and things like that. And there was very little of that going on by that time, if you can imagine, because we'd just come out of the wild 60s, et cetera. And it was a very different culture then. So it took until 1975, and by then I, 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 was, I was 35. I thought I knew a few things. And I was taught a really important lesson. And that lesson was, if you want to bring the world to you, well, you better be ready to do your part. So the thing was is that what we did was we put together the very first international um, powwow. If you've ever been to the States, I'm sure that you've had the privilege of seeing how those were. So they sent me out to have a look at this, and they said, well, if you think this is, uh, would work for us, we'll do it. So I went and spent some time down in uh, Washington State, found out, yeah, this could really work for us, and we worked very, very hard for three months. And it doesn't matter to me what the background of the person who is coming to this event or any other there is one little kernel of information that will, if you have that takeaway, it will have been worth all the time that has been spent preparing for this big celebration or whatever celebration that we're in. If we have that one little thing that we can take away or one little thing that we can say, yes, I can improve on that in the coming year, I can do something about that. So in, in that, we also invited people from all 
nationalities to come and share their, their culture with us. It was in our venue. We held it out in the park uh, every Thursday night. So we had people come from every uh, nation and bring their traditional food, etc. And we honored it all. So that's what I, I mean. A spirituality. There is unity in diversity. And again, it, 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 is, it is about respect. It's respecting that person's spirit. The spirit of the ancestry that comes with this individual. Doesn't matter where it comes from. It could come from any part of the world. And there are some times, though, you know, when we gather up just in our community, when it just feels really good that each and every one of us have very common experiences. Because we've shared these ceremonies tens of thousands of generations. So holding respect for others, diversity, first of all. Holding that respect. And holding respect for your own ancestry, to me, are the, the two most important things that, that I found unified us over the course of the years that we, uh, that we had this event. And so um, I know that it's probably a very different view, but this is the one that, uh, that I know the best, and that's why I'm sharing it with you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Grandmother Malihekwa. So that, that helps me to uh, come to the next, a little bit of a side sub question about the third culture. So some people have heard of the third culture, you know, like as talking about indigenous people from around the world coming together with non-indigenous people to create a culture that's a bit new and a culture more where we're learning from indigenous people to connect to the land and heal the land. So I would like to have a bit of insight on what... So you already given a big insight onto that, and it's a wonderful thing and a very exciting thing. Uh, I would like to see if there's anybody else in the panel that would like to have a bit of insight on what it means for us, maybe non-Indigenous people, what it means for us in the future to fight the crisis that's, that we all face today. Anybody else got an opinion on that? Uh, I just want to say first, I'm not an elder. I'm only a young fellow, spring chicken. But I'm honored to be sitting up here and thank you for uh, coming and listening this morning. Um, one thing what I noticed I is when they talk about spirit unite and things like that, that's all true. But what I really see is a lot of people looking for culture. That's why you got someone with a dream catcher earring, a bongo drum under the arm, a dot on the forehead, a didgeridoo under the wing. <laughs> See, you want a little bit of this and that, eh? Because you're looking back for your culture, where you come from, eh? So, you know, a lot of people sitting here, I got English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh. If I keep going back, half me go back to Africa somewhere. Other half come back here. So maybe that's why I'm going a dreaming, seeing two worlds, eh? Yeah, we live between the two worlds. So when, uh, when you look at your ancestry, go back further than just what you learnt in the books. Because the book, just written by some fellow, you got a tricky story, that bloke. <laughs> so go back further, where there's no book. And we all come back to the land, eh? Everyone originally to the land, aren't you? Yeah. Who flew in on a spaceship? Uh. There might be someone out there. Anyone? Oh, yeah, Any of you mob got spaceship in the garage? Take me for a burn. Uh. So we all originally to the earth. We all go back to it. Then when you have a look at that, we all originally, we all go back to black, we all come from the earth, then what's all the rubbish been about? What's all the rubbish been about all these written book history time? Yeah. What was it about? What they wanted us to think. 
Big Buru. You know what Buru? Man part. High rise buildings. Standing up. How many women made high rise building? So that's a lot about egos and greed and jealousies and all them things. Didn't all our cultures in the beginning have the Ten Commandments and the Seven Deadly Sins? Well, all originally ones had 7,000 million deadly sins and many, many commandments too. So why I'm saying all this is that just because you've read some history about maybe I'm German, maybe I'm this, maybe I'm that, maybe I'm English, and then you're a bit maybe shamed. You feel a bit shamed of to say I'm from there. That's only young history, isn't it? Your ancestry goes back further to back to the earth. So what is the Origini people's job? Anyone know? You must, come on. Search your heart and soul for it. What is our Origini job for human beings on the planet? Anyone know? Huh? Look after the place, isn't it? So when you start to look after the place, what you live in, where you air, you breathe, water, you drink, all your countrymen, all your relatives, plants and everything, then you've got your spiritual unity, haven't you? Because you're back to your earth, your roots. So a lot of people say to me, hey, um, I went and done the peyote ceremony and the ayahuasca and the this and the that. They done every plant medicine they can think about. And then they come up and said, hey, so have you aborigines? Have you got something I can take too? <laughs> I say, nah. Well, we do, but you're not allowed to have it yet. <coughs> It'd be like giving baby a bottle of spirits. In the, in the baby bottle. Here, drink that, bub. <laughs> you got to learn first before you go and do that, eh? And so what I say to them is, if you want to get a connection there, because they say, oh, well, when I had an ayahuasca, I was fast-tracking to spirit. Like human race, we're in a race somewhere. We gotta, we're in a competition with each other, we've got to get there first. Where are we going? Where are we progressing to? <laughs> so what I said to them was, go out bush. Somewhere out of your comfort zone. Make your camp. But learn a little bit about going bush first. Don't just wander out there from the city. <laughs> Otherwise, Westpac helicopter might have to come get you. <laughs> learn how to make a fire. Yeah. But not in any kind of weather like this. Look, you might burn the whole place up. <laughs> learn how, what's a bit bush tucker there, how to fish, something like that. So that you're okay, you're not gonna go out and die. Who's seen that movie, Into the Wild? <laughs> See, poor fella Ray made me cry, that movie. <laughs> so when you go out bush there and you sit in not your comfort zone and you start to get used to those ants and mosquitoes that are bothering you and you're no more scared of that owl in the tree, when you can get up and go, oh, hello, owl. G'day, Mr. Snake. Okay, Bolant, I'm not near your nest no more then you start to feel connected to that little place, eh? And you didn't have to take anything except your own cheeks into the bush. Yeah. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mijai. Awesome, awesome. Double deadly we're here, double deadly. <laughs> that was great. Awesome. Anybody else would like to uh, have a bit of a talk about spiritual unity before we move on to the next question? I yeah? Right. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm still going back to the 1970s when uh, we were really scattered about and drugs and alcohol was the, was the leading cause of um, domestic violence and deaths and all that sort of thing. And one of the th things that brought us together was our relatives coming from all the four directions on Turtle Islands, what we call North, North America's Turtle Island. And we had 
the most wonderful people come. And I will mention one that I, I knew and loved very dearly, and that was uh, Frank Fusco. Oh. And uh, one of the things that he did was to uh, have his helpers bring out uh, a seashell with a sage smudge in it, and everybody who wanted to take part in that ceremony did so. And one of the things that that has done has made it okay, made it universal to use a smudge. Uh, the people uh, where I come from uh, didn't need to smudge because we lived in uh, cedar longhouses and we started our fires every morning with a little bit of cedar kindling so that the, our, our homes were always, always smudged that way. But when we uh, went out into the greater world, none of those things were available anymore. And as you know, even if you know a language and you don't use it for some time, you're going to forget it or forget some of it or some of the important steps. So one of the things that I found unifying, especially where we, we come from, where there's an, uh, celebrations of, uh, uh, of all kinds going on, is the, is the smudge. And one of the, the beautiful things that I discovered here last night as I went to, we were sharing the Women's Warrior song made in my territory in the mountains. And it's called the Women's Warrior song and I have permission to sing that all over the world. And so I do. And so last night while we were in circle, we shared that. So sometime along the way, I'm going to be doing a, a, a children's um, reading and we're going, I think we'll probably share something like that because we're going to dance too. I brought social dances. And so I wanted to mention that because I, I want to share with you and I want to learn from you. I've been watching you for a long time and sharing with you. Mm -hmm. So, um, I just I needed to share that part about the unity through using, borrowing those things that we need to help us to remember our inner spirit. That's what I wanted to share with you. And then that's how we begin. And then we go deeper into our own, our own way, because that's where we have to start, is to find it within ourselves, what is meant for us to follow. So. I won't say any more because I could write a book. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Grandmother. Oh. Talking about smudging, maybe it would be great to have a bit of an indigenous insight into the smudging that you guys do here in this country because it could be something that maybe people uh, in Australia could maybe use, maybe. Um, so it would be great to hear some indigenous perspective on this. Yeah, my name's Marilyn, Lani Marilyn, and I'd like to comment a little bit about that. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge fellow um, members on the panel and how wise our members are, and um, also acknowledge the fact that I'm not an ego or an I person, that I have shared some journeys in my learning path of um, understanding my own spiritual journey and growth, um, and I've acknowledged that as a, um, a respectful thing in the way of who I am today. Um, that's been a long journey, so I guess the, the growth of spirit is important and that journey is of, um, of that spirit and its growth is highly important. And I hear what Mujai is saying and how true you are, um, as in your words of wisdom. Um, I had to have a big chuckle to myself because I think to myself, really it is about getting back to the grounding and the basics. And this day and age we've got so much fabricated stuff that can often lead you off your pathway. Um, to who we are as people and um, who we were when we were born as spirit and spirit people, all right? Um, so even today, I, I just want to strengthen that message too that we need to look after each other even here at this big camp, um, make sure everyone's right with water and taking care of each other and if they're doing stuff, all right? So when my journey came to learn about smudge and smoke, we call it just smoke. My grandmother, we used to camp out the forest in, on the river, the Murray River, the Malu, and we used to wonder why at the end of the day Nan used to sleep outside the tent and wanted her camp bed just outside the tent and always last to have her rolly uh, smoke, smoke before she um, decided to settle. But she'd chuck this bush, these plant leaves on this coals and there would be a gentle smoke. And we'd hear muk muk, muk muk, call at night but us kids had to go to bed early because Mook Mook would get us, so that fear of Mook Mook was implanted in us, but I've learned to how to um, understand Mook Mook 
over the years and what the path of the owl has um, in my journey. So, um, so NAM was my very first introduction into smoke and smudge. Um, so over the years, in my journeys, I've learnt how smudge works, how smoke works and how it works with the well-being and the balance and who we are as peoples and how to um, bring some balance into our spiritual growth. I did work as a nurse years ago, but that was something that was never taught to us about spiritual growth and how to use our stuff, our earthy stuff, in that growth. It was always an approach about a medical approach. So it was never in the books to learn um, what Ben had spoken about is the spiritual realm. So that journey grew on me years and years down the track to who I am today and how I understand even my eagle spirit, out-of-body stuff. All right, and. Um, and how smoke can actually work without even the bite of a snake to ground you in your spirit to realms as you travel. So these are just some of the things in the spiritual realm that my journey has brought me to who I am today. But looking at the history of our people too and what's happened to our people and our elders and our medicine peoples and our family groups, a lot of that was taken away and, and um, broken from us. Otherwise it would have been taught from one one family to the next. So I'm grateful for my journey to help me understand who we are now and how we understand this stuff, but to use our own stuff and our own earthy stuff within our environment. Um, so which brings me to probably a little bit about water, if I want to talk about water, if that's okay. So I've been working with Jar Jarung people in the past year um, with our waterways, and our country is called Upside Down Country, and it's Upside Down Country because of the many aspects of gold and the value of gold upon the world. And we had many visitors from other countries throughout the world that came to mine that gold. And hence our lands were poisoned with many other things. So our role is now to try and heal that earth and work with that environment, which means revegetation works and also working with waters, um, which is a big, big job for the Jajarong peoples and for many other First Nations that are cleaning up their lands to try and help. Um, so it's all focused also around whether or not you can get funding to help out with that progress. Um, so we're very strong on taking care of country. Um, we are from the earth, so we go back to the earth. And um, I also think too that um, you can have your teachers along the way. And no disrespect to my teachers, there have been quite a few in my travels. Um, but it's also about understanding where you fit in those teachings that you um, are given and how that works with you and your spiritual growth, all right? And staying on track and staying in balance with that. So hence, back to the bush is always a good way to reflect and also to use that smoke to help bring back balance and take your time, as in space on time, not just the timeline of rush, rush, rush. All right, so thank you. Thank you very much, Auntie Mallorin. Actually, you just reminded me, Auntie Marilyn, about um, the land settlement that the Jajarung just signed um, quite a few years back with the state government and um, that role that he actually took for the Jajarung to care for country. Um, would it be possible to talk a little bit about what happened with the land settlement and what it means for the Jajarung people about caring for country? I won't talk too much about that, um, but I'll just because it's a long journey, it had taken quite a f many years and. Um, it's also a very sensitive journey for some of those members of the Jajarung people who are here with us today. Um, it's also focused around working with government and understanding. Government understanding our journey as First Nations people. It's never been an easy one and it still isn't. So at the moment we're in a safe space, I think not a comfortable space, but a space where we can learn how to develop partnerships and work with other people and hopefully reverse that they work with us to give a bit and not expect to utilise our funding stuff and that to um, care for country. It's everybody's responsibility. We didn't make the mess of our lands. For thousands of years our lands have been at one with us. Um, so I don't want to reflect on blaming people but within that 200 year timeline we have got now a mess of a landscape that we need to try and put back the best way we can as we knew it. So. To me, that journey is about that, um, the environment and who we are as peoples and claiming who we are is, or well, probably not the word claiming, but for people to understand who we are as those First Nation peoples um, when caring for country. It's more than just a piece of land that's real estate. 
it's in a much, much more deeper level of appeal back. It goes back to ancestral stuff way, way back. So it's, it's a connection of understanding the dreaming, even and understanding those dreaming stories to do with how our landscapes were created as well and us as people. So, yeah. Thank you, Auntie Marilyn. So I might bring on the uh, following questions uh, for the members of the, the panel here. So the next question is about collective consciousness. And what I wrote here is the, um, the ev evolvement of human consciousness. So why did the Western world split from nature? Um, and how can we regain and learn how to have a deeper understanding of our connection to land? And also, um, maybe like if we could talk about how um, the culture has been reclaimed by a lot of the young people as well. And I thought, uh, Juanita, you might have a bit of a good insight on, on that aspect of things, if, if you're happy to do that. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to my ancestors for bringing me here and to the ancestors of this land and our tribal people here, our mob people here for inviting us. A little closer, is that better? So I, I think it's always important for me to just really quickly share maybe why I'm up here and, and um, why I'm considered a tribal person. And then we, we can see how um, there's been a couple people mentioning how we go about looking for our ancestry. We go about looking for who we are and why we're here. And then we understand from that a little bit more about um, what we can do to further um, and, and how, how we all fit together and how, how it is, you know, we, we come to be in that unifying place that several have talked about and, and that my husband and I worked on for, gosh, 31, 31 years now, it's hard to believe, with spiritual unity of the world gatherings. But when I was a teenager, I lived in Ethiopia. My parents were teachers for the United States military and they were stationed in Ethiopia. And I was walking down, just this little teenage girl, walking down the streets of Asmara, Ethiopia, and I was tapped on the shoulder by a, an Ethiopian gentleman who said in perfect British English, pardon me, and I'm not going to be able to speak British very well, pardon me, but are you a blonde oriental? And I looked at him and I, I said, no, I'm an American. <laughs> and I didn't know what he meant. And after that, I started to look at my features. And as I got older, I had people say to me, well, you're, you're one of those guys from up north. I'm like, I, what do you mean, those guys? Well, you know those tribal people up north. They, they chase the reindeer around. And I started to look into that, and I finally did get my father to admit, well, yeah, we came over here because it was bad over there, so that's all I'm going to tell you about that. But we left because it was bad. Well, yes, it was bad because the people there had the same problems as the people in this country. My native people whom I've worked with and lived around in the United States, the Canadian Aboriginal people. The Aboriginal people, if you look back far enough into your tribal heritage, the Aboriginal people have all been treated similarly. And because of that, they've become, um, they've lost their culture. It was um, 1978 that finally our federal government in the United States said, okay, you native people, you can do your ceremonies again. Prior to 1978, they were not allowed to be sun dancers as my husband then became. Um, they were not allowed to even do sweat lodges 
uh, legally, they had to do things underground, so they would take ceremony at nighttime and do it way, way out there, away from um, the authorities. And so many of the culture was lost, so much of the culture was lost, just like in most, most countries, because we had that put upon us that we should become something that we were not. When I've looked now at my heritage as a Sami woman um, and a follower of the reindeer and a reindeer people, we had the same things. We, were, we had our drums taken from us. We were no longer allowed to do shamanistic uh, traditional ceremony. All of our drums were burned. The Norwegian government forced the people to become good Lutherans, not Catholics, but you know, Catholics aren't the only ones that have an edge on, on this uh, thou shalt become one of us thing. It was the Lutherans too, and um, well, I guess if it weren't for Martin Luther, we would have all still been Catholics, but Martin Luther started that Lutheran tradition and they were pretty much the same and they wanted everybody to be like them and you couldn't have your drum and pray in a shamanistic way. So um, we have all lost so much of where we're at and when I look at that, I think maybe it's a good jumping off place for us to become more unified as we look for a way to do these things together, trying to put that spiritual unity, as my husband mentioned, taking care of your spirit, accepting people the way they are, and trying to promote spiritual unity. And when you do that, then you solve so many of the other things we've been talking about with um, our water. Um, my husband was two years ago, just a little over two years ago, arrested. <laughs> I, I say, you know, in our country you can be arrested for inciting riot. Well, I tell everybody, no, my husband was arrested for inciting prayer. And they look at me kind of funny, like inciting prayer. What do you mean? Well, yeah, he was standing there making a prayer, helping an elder pray, and they were making a prayer, and they were arrested. So um, we, we still are being put upon to be something we're not. And so if, if we can look at our similarities more than our differences, perhaps then we can start that road to spiritual unity. So I hope that did a little bit toward that question. <laughs> Very beautiful, Juanita. Thank you so much. It'd be interesting to know a little bit, talking, uh, I might move between the questions a little bit just to help with the conversation, but it would be great to know, talking about the sustainable future, what you and Ben have been doing in South Dakota, uh, the fight that you've been doing against the, the uh, pipeline there. It'd be interesting to know your role and, and how that's going and, and you know, a bit of an update and, and see where that's at. Um, that's a... That's a very loaded question. <laughs> There's so much. Uh, I didn't know that was going to be one of the questions, so now, um, yeah. There's so, <laughs> there's so much uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, my wife mentioned being at Doppel and uh, being arrested uh, for praying and being thrown in a dog cage and a number written on our arm <coughs> and stripped naked, dehumanized, the indignity for simply praying. Yes, there were those ones that you see on the media and on uh, the web who were throwing their fist in the air and 
using invectives and very harsh language. There were those. But uh, older ones, we, we knew that the true power that would be needed does not come through that physical energy. It comes through that spiritual consciousness. And without the help of something greater than ourselves that we would not succeed. Uh, through that prayer, I was absolved of all the charges. It wasn't because of the legal minds and my good lawyer, a good lawyer, yes. There was something else that was afoot. There was something else that helped us. And my brother and I, particularly Russell Eagle Bear, we were, we were absolved and uh, free. But my point is that uh, we look at the collective consciousness that we need, the question that the moderator has asked, the collective consciousness of each one of us as a child of something greater than ourselves and our being individually. That word collective, who you are, what tribe you came from because you were once part of a tribe. Now, we are all of a family of humanity. When we fully realize that, when we fully take that into our consciousness, into our being, our emotions, our thoughts, every part of us, what we can do, we can do the impossible. And that is to bring us back to a time before time, so to speak, when all the earth, in the sense of the maka, the earth, was one land. And as we became disunified because of color, because of language, we say, as I said, Turtle Island, my relative mentioned that. It was broken up. And if you look at the continents, they fit together like a puzzle. You look at their shapes and you put them together. It was one land. And we were one people. We are one people. Yes, we are. Why? Why? We are. Have we looked at ourselves as different because you have blue eyes you have brown eyes you have blonde hair red hair you're short you're skinny whatever <laughs> we uh, there's a i'd like to well i, I won't mention that because it's kind of long but there's a we we I'm working with a, a relative right now. Where's Daniel? Where did you go? Oh, there you go. A relative who works with the blind. And I'm going to be working on a project in the States about the components of our being, our heart, mind, body, and spirit. And he works with the blind people. And I said, I want to interview them. I want to talk to them because so much of what we do in our language to one another and between nations is because we can see. Not because we can feel. But we use these to make the difference and to see difference. We don't use the spirit. We don't use that collective idea of what was mentioned here, that we all individually are different, yes. And we're beautiful. Don't doubt yourself in your beauty. And it's like we, we need this collective understanding of one another's beauty. What comes through these eyes? I'm not a great fan of shades. 
nothing against all of you wearing shades. Because when we first saw them, they said, this person, we don't know if we're, they're a human being or not. Our older ones talked about them because we can't see the spirit of that, that thing. Why is it a thing? Yes, it has two legs, two arms, but we cannot see the spirit. To see the humanity of that person, to fully connect to that person's with ourselves. That's our collective consciousness that comes through the eyes and that it is that spirit. We have to create this understanding of ourselves. And together, we can do the impossible. We can create a future for our children and our grandchildren. And those unborn that you will never see yet, you will not see in your time. But they're coming. Be assured. There will be those who are your descendants. And what will you leave for them? What are you going to leave as a sign of your being and your love? I'm very passionate about this, as maybe you can tell. I rarely raise my voice. But I'm very passionate about it. And you have to have that passion that you want something greater for your children's 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 children. What are you going to do? What are we going to do? Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank so you. I'd, I'd like to add just a real quick little bit to that because um, I, I, Ben was the one that was arrested. And I started to get calls about noon on that day uh, from, interestingly, friends way out in Washington State. We live in South Dakota. He was up in North Dakota. And they started to call me and text me and, uh, is your husband being arrested? Is, is Uncle Ben being arrested? And I'm like, no, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Well, you better get on Facebook and look. <laughs> Well, I have gotten on Facebook since that time, but I wasn't before then. But what I did start to do, and this is maybe that collective sustainability that I didn't kind of go into, but what it prompted me to do because of mm, the feelings that it conjured up when I started to get those calls. Because Ben, was, as an archaeologist and a tribal historic preservation officer, was supposed, he was supposed to be at meetings on the reservation near where DAPL was taking place. But he and, and our Sundance brother, Russell Eagle Bear, are really strongly opposed to making those kinds of uh, political statements where you go and get arrested. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't think he went over there. You know, I was really surprised people were calling me. And so it, it was so hurtful to start to realize and see pictures. His cousin sent me a picture of him sitting there with his hands tied behind his back on the ground. And I'm, I'm, it's just a really hard thing for a spousal unit <laughs> to see when your, you know, when your family member is on the ground and surrounded by military-looking individuals. And so it prompted me to do a little bit of research into that company. Mm, who... Who really is behind all of that? And I, I wanted to know. I mean, Ben could tell me the name of the company that 
they were actually meeting with that day that he was arrested, but he was behind the scenes trying to make um, inroads with those companies so that they would stop. And I started to then research, well, okay, who's supplying all the money for that enterprise? And if you do a little research, you'll find there are 30 six banks involved at least, maybe more now, 36 international banks that are involved to the tune of at least $300 million a piece. Each of those banks, the top three banks, um, of which the Bank of Japan Mitsubishi is number three, to the tune of $400 million. So you can see it didn't hurt their feelings to not be making money for a few days while they were fighting these pesky Indians in North and South Dakota. They didn't care. They had all this money behind them. I, I mean, when I multiply 36 times 300 million, it's a, it's a number I can't even conjure up in my beady little brain. And so all these banks are then making the cars we drive. I have found there's four cars that don't seem to be connected, although you still have to put gas in them. I suppose Tesla is one, but then the other four are Mazda, Volvo, Hyundai, and Kia. And so those five, with Tesla being one, are not mm, connected to those banks that promote the pipelines, all the pipelines. And so there's only a couple, three companies that own the pipelines and they're all owned by those banks. Um, and so that's something that I encourage all of you to do. We got out of Wells Fargo because that was the fourth largest bank and we were using Wells Fargo Bank. And while it was, it made things a lot harder because they actually had a branch on the reservation making it easy for us to do banking business, it, it took almost an act of God to get out of that bank. Oh, you don't want to leave us. We supply all this local money. We help your people locally. And I'm like, yeah, but look what you're doing internationally. Well, we don't do that. We're here. We're helping you locally. Oh, I, it, so I just encourage you to start looking deeper at, you know, where, where all the money is being used. Where is it coming from and where are these things? So <laughs> one of the things I'm trying to also get rid of is our vehicle. We drive a Mitsubishi Outlander. I run around with that logo right on the front of the vehicle, and I want to get rid of that car so badly, but it's not in the cards right now, but I'm working towards that. I just don't even want to promote Mitsubishi because they're, you know, the number third bank on that list. So I'm trying to, to just encourage you to look at these things, like where, where is our money coming from? Who's supplying all of these things, and what can we do? What, I mean, is there just a little thing, like maybe getting out of the bank that you're using? Um, just do a little research, so. Thanks, Juanita. Yeah, we have a similar, a similar fight happening here in this country as well with the Great Barrier Reef, as you know, and, and a lot of people acting for climate, you know, climate change. So we, it's very important, especially for young people, to really consider, you know, the elders wisdom and, and acting on those things. Yeah. Um, I think grand, grandmother here had something to say <coughs> added to that as well, so. Um, first of all, I would like to raise up my hands to Ben Rudd and his beautiful bride for the work that they did. And it is a very difficult thing to be on the front lines. And I thank you in our West Coast traditional way. Oh. This is what we do. Oh, Okay, we're going to have to t finish very shortly because I'd like to have a bit of uh, time for questions. Um, uh, 
I still have this. I want to go back to the to tie this up to what I started with. I'd like to finish this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Uh, uh, in um, upon reflection of the things that we've been discussing, um, what I believe sincerely in, uh, in my travels around the world is that we're uh, being asked to practice evolution. Oh. Evolution of our spirit. Oh. Changing our mental uh, processes to eliminate all the things that we believe that we need. If we don't have this material thing or that material <laughs> thing, uh, we're not keeping up with the Joneses and we're disappointing ourselves, etc. cetera. And, um, and I believe that we need to move away from that more we need to stand up with the people who are on the front lines to say that this is not acceptable because it is the corporations that are ruling the world, whether we want to admit it or not to ourselves or to our countries. I'm talking about Canada, and I'm not proud of our part in it either uh, because uh, I, I believe that we, we held a very honorable place in this world, and then we let it go through greed, through ignorance, and through uh, hanging on to the colonial imperialist way of life. So we need to, what you come here for, what your spirit is asking of you is to return to the seven spiritual laws. Take it one by one by one. Take it one of them as long as it takes you to understand the meaning of love, the meaning of generosity, the meaning of courage, standing up for what you believe in. To understand what true humbleness is. And the greatest one of all is respect. Respecting ourselves and our actions and feeling proud of, of our ability to do our very best in any situation, it's a hard thing to achieve. But recognize that moment when it comes to you because it'll lead you to bigger and greater things in the future. And of course, the other thing that I'm a, a, a very strong believer in is that it was taught to me from a very young age and that is responsibility for my actions and being responsible to the world around me, etc. But the greatest of all of that is, is, is love. And I'm saying to you, be proud of your identity. You go past. I'm asking you to go past the generation of immigrants that came here. However they got here, it was hard. It was dirty, it was mean. And you lost your human dignity through that process being brought here. Now I'm asking you to go beyond that and look way beyond that to the depths of what your tribal spirituality is. Because when we forget our tribal beginnings, it becomes them and us. We need to bring ourselves together as a world. And it starts with us here. There are so many other places that you could have been today. I feel so honored that you have come and have come and shared this time, allowed us to speak a few words to you. Uh, I am so honored to sit with these wisdom keepers and to share with you what little I know. 
because I've learned nothing in this life except to use my brain, the left brain in a technological manner that helps me to get around the world and come and see you. <laughs> Thank you, Thank beautiful you. grandmother Mahakwa. That would be great. So do we do we want to do a few questions before that then? Uh, a few questions before that? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay, we probably we're just about to finish and we're gonna finish with um, Uncle Ben doing a beautiful uh, drumming song. But before we probably have time for a few questions, maybe three questions from the audience if you would like. Yeah. Are you okay to come at the front and I'll pass you the microphone? Thanks. Hello, my name's David. Thank you, elders, grandmother. Um, I've just got a question. Uh, I'll be, I work at the city of Sydney, First Nations man. That's the area that bore the brunt of invasion and colonisation in this beautiful country. But what we try to do is find a balance. And I've heard a beautiful narrative here. My question to the panel, when we talk about all those important um, uh, agendas, um, headings, I think all of which are equally as important. I want to know what you think about people coming back, asking us about our knowledge, Aunty Mar Marilyn, you touched on it, asking us about our knowledge, but in a sense expecting it without paying for cultural intellectual property. So that's my question. Oh. It's very important. We're on the cusp of the knowledge economy. People are coming to us. And it's something, and I wonder what your opinion is on that. Do we just hand it over or do we make them pay? I have an answer for that. Okay, he, we have an answer for this one. Thank you very much for asking the question. I'll tell you, I had the most wonderful teacher in about 1995. His name, uh, I went to visit my elder who didn't make it to the Sundance because he was sick in uh, Portland, Oregon. And I stopped somewhere in the Dallas and I was asking questions about, where do you find Martin Highbear? He was a medicine man, you see. Oh, one big fella said, uh, well, you'll find it, but you have to go through this. It's about 10 miles. And he said, when you see a tree all decorated, he said, that's, uh, that will be the box. They just finished their sundowns. So I went there. And I didn't want to bother them because they had just finished their sundance and I thought, well, they could use their rest. So I slept in my car. So they come knocking on the window with a cuppa in the morning. And why are you here? They said, well, I said, I'm looking for Martin Highbear. Well, isn't that wonderful? They said, because we're just going to go and find him and uh, uh, follow us. And this is what he said. And I have never forgotten it because it really resonated with me. Because we had the same question as was brought here. What, what do you do? And a long time ago, as a medicine person, all of my needs were met. I had a home to live in. People brought wood, they brought meat, they brought fish, they brought everything, medicines. They had People would come and I would teach them how to do medicines and they would do that later when I was you know, not able to do it. He said, I could give you a trunk full of tobacco. I could fill up your car with uh, blankets, he said, but that won't get you to the next place you have to go. And at that time, our Canadian dollar was very low compared to the Americans, and I had a little wee, beater little car. He handed me a $100 bill, and it got me down to the Dells, it got me to Portland, and all the way through Washington State, you know how long that is and up to Kamloops, British Columbia. I made it there, and that was the beginning of the next journey that I had to take into the next two provinces over called Saskatchewan. So there comes a time when we have to accept, I have to accept as a medicine person that the exchange is now paper. It is not an exchange of buffalo hides, deer hides, and moose hides, and uh, salmon. They used to stack them up 100 high for our use. So people don't have that to offer anymore, but this is the medium of exchange. 
Now this was told to me in 1995, and I hope that helped your, your question. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Because we have to understand the value of what has been given to us through the spirits of the ancestors and to the teachers that we have <coughs> so that we can carry it on. You can't carry it on if you can't get from place to place to present what it is that people need. And we are in great need, as we have expressed here today. Does that help you answer your question? All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Kingdom Can I, could I just, uh, I'm, I'm really, thanks for that question, Dave. I'm really wrestling with it. When, when, when I, I started out, I talked about the gift. And the gift is something that's freely given and, and received in the same way. And our knowledge, our understandings come from nature, come from spirit, and it's been freely given. We are the custodians of that information. We are the custodians of that knowledge. And, and the moment that we put a price on that, then the question is, does that stop becoming a gift? As I said, the gift is something that keeps going around and round and keeps on giving. And the moment that we put conditions on it, it stops becoming a gift. I'm really wrestling with that because at the same time, thanks, at the same time, our knowledge, our understandings, we've been here for a long time and our spiritual roots are really deep and we collectively have a lot of knowledge. And, but it, needs, it must be valued. If it's not valued, we are devalued. Now, there, so I'm, I'm not quite sure where the, the answer lies. And we have to be really careful. In, in the Bible, it talks about uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. And we have to be very discerning when we're interacting in, and, and uh, transacting with other peoples and other bodies as evidenced in the states when you look at the the mining that's going on over there uh, and and it's and it's supported or the, whole, the whole thing is buttressed by um, th these banks and so uh, you know we have to be really discerning by uh, when, when we're uh, interacting with others um, you know as to who we're actually dealing with uh, you know, are they going to appropriate our culture and our knowledge and, and, and use it against us, divide us, and, and, and diminish the, the value of what it is that we're offering? Now, they, these are very real questions. And I just want to round off what I'm going to be saying today by, by you know, we, there's a story, the, the, the Bible starts out in the book of with the book of Genesis and it talks about Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve eat of the fruit and they're kicked out of the garden. So let's unpack that just a little bit, very briefly. They're in, when you're in the garden, they're, they're connected, they're indigenous, right? Then all of a sudden something happens and they become non-indigenous. Right? Non-indigenous in the sense that they're, connect, they're not connected to the land. But when we follow the, the humanity's journey, there's always we're trying to get back to land. We're trying to get back to land. That is our journey. And we get removed from land. My parents were removed from our homelands when they were children as a result of colonisation in this country. And we were trying to get back to land. That is the human condition, that is the human story, I think. And so, and the question was put to us, how can we, you know, how can we uh, fix the environmental problems, you know? And I'm just wondering whether that is the question or whether, is, is, or whether the, the question is about our relationship to the environment. It's not so much how do we fix the environment, but what is our relationship to the environment, right? So let's take that a little step further and then I'll finish. What is our relationship with ourselves? And that gets to our identity and understanding what our identity is and our cultural heritage. And we must understand that because that informs us as to who we are. And 
then are we having a good relationship with ourselves? And if we are able to have good relationships with ourselves, we're able to have good relationships with other people. And if we can have good relationships with other people, surely we can have a, greater, a good relationship with that greater environment of God. And that's what I think we're talking about here today is the, our relationship. And I think it's our relationship that has been uh, with, with, with the environment and the greater environment with God that um, is at, at, has been broken. And we've talked about ways of, 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 of um, getting back and fixing that relationship through ritualization of things. Yeah, that's the smoking ceremony and all that sort of stuff. And we, and, and we must do that, okay? Thank you very much, Phil, for that. Thank you, that's great. Sorry, we had to cut short because I've got to look at the clock a bit. I wish we had a bit more time, everyone. So I won't have time for the questions. I'm so sorry. We could have stayed here all day, I reckon. I wish we could. Um, so we're going to... So thank you very much for <coughs> the people, the elders on the panel, and thanks for the audience for this beautiful um, panel that we had today. So we're going to finish with a beautiful drumming from Uncle Ben, um, and then we can maybe say our goodbyes and, and applause for everyone and we will let you on your way and um, hopefully you have a great and wonderful rest of the festival. Just so let's Ben start. Just before Uncle does that, I'd just like to say to all you fellas out there, thank you for being patient in the heat, listening, good on you. You know, like Andy said, you could have been anywhere else but you was here. Uh, you know, this subject can go on all day so all they all connect. We got our Karangla down there. See down the bottom of the hill? That's our camp. That's how you can come, there's, we're on dream time in there. We're not on just this here time. So you can come down there and yarn up and you know, if you see our old people getting too tired, then leave them alone. <laughs> or go and get them a cup of tea and massage their foot something. Wow. And you earn that knowledge yeah. what you come and asking for. <laughs> and there's a journey to get to it. Journey in life, isn't it? Yo. Yeah, and so then, you know, that's how you got to go. Come down to our camp. That's why we put him there, so you can come and chill out with us. This afternoon, we're going to do a dance. Some people might like to join us for that. If you've been hitting the drugs and stuff hard, well, maybe next year for you. <laughs> come down there, be nice and clean, ready for dance in front of everyone, but you can come and watch if you like. So, yeah, that's what they're cutting laugh for. Come down there and check it out, all right? Oh, Rebecca has got something to say. Do you want to come to Rebecca? Sorry. Um, thank you so much. This has made me so happy hearing all of this beautiful wisdom shared with everyone. If you want to continue to hear more, we have um, Annie Marilyn's doing weaving in the Karang La tomorrow. We have a Sunday session four till eight and everyone will be up there. And Ben will be doing more on Standing Rock Sioux in a, an hour in the Karang La in the back teepee. And uh, yeah, you can uh, look in the program to see more. Bruce Pascoe is coming tomorrow. Yeah, and he will talk more on some things here. Thank you, Beck. Thank you, Beck. I'd like uh, for everyone to stand, please. You've been sitting, and I, I saw a couple of guys over here. Their eyes were starting to uh, kind of go down. <laughs> this song is about a nation coming. It's about a nation that is coming. Now that seems in the. I'm not defining that nation. I'm just saying, in the song, a nation is coming. Look at us. Wamayankayo, look at us. Okay. And you're welcome to uh, kind of get into the beat of it. Shela wa ma yonko yeh 
Thank you. Oh. Thank you, everyone. What a beautiful afternoon we had. Thank you. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the festival, everyone. And don't forget, you can come and have a chat with the elders down that part of the village. Okay, have a good day, everyone. Bye.